If it makes you feel more invigorated, more alive, more you to be in that body, then it's okay. Aesthetic surgery is fine. It's, it's aligned with your intention of, of showing up as the best version of yourself. This is Awakened Love, the podcast, and I'm your host, Angel. This is a space where we get real, real about sex, love, and awakening. So strap in, let's go deep. What's up, beautiful awakened humans, and welcome to another episode of Awakened Love. And today we have Dr. Jonathan Konevsky, who is a board certified plastic surgeon. He's originally from New York, but lives now in Topanga, California, and has his very own practice in Beverly Hills that specializes in an alternative to breast implant surgery, which is fat grafting. It's a arguably safer, more natural alternative to breast implants. And we're here to talk all things beauty and plastic surgery and how to walk the line between body positivity and body enhancement. So he's a dear brother of mine, a conscious man, an ethical human being, and I'm very grateful to have him here today. Dr. John, sweet brother. Thank you so much for being here. My great pleasure. Thank you for having me, Angel. Yeah. So I just would love to give a little intro on who you are for our listeners. Obviously, I just gave them a little bite-sized taste, but it'd be great to hear in your words, who is Jonathan Konevsky, Dr. John, as known to your beloveds? (laughs) Sure. So I am a board-certified plastic surgeon based here in Los Angeles. I live in Topanga, California. Originally from New York, I did my medical training in Canada, um, where I did a plastic surgery residency and then moved to LA to do uh, further training in aesthetic surgery. My practice and my my life's mission and daily work is dedicated to uh, helping women through their transformations, uh, specifically focused on breast implant um, associated illness and disease. Um, So uh, doing surgery related to the breast, removing implants and um, fat crafting as it relates to, to breast surgery. Um, I've been trained in in a bunch of different parts of plastic surgery, but I've chosen to focus on this specific area um, as I'm really passionate about it. Yeah, let's dive right on in. Can you tell, you just mentioned breast um, implant illness. So can Mm -hmm. we talk about what that is? And then you just mentioned this like alternative, which is fat grafting. And then I want to talk about what that is. So let's start with the breast implant illness. What is that? Sure. So uh, breast implant illness is something that's become a a more and more popular term over the past, I'd say, five or six years. I first heard about it as a surgeon for the first time about six, seven years ago. Um, And there's been a lot of controversy about implants for a long time. Um, This is not a new issue. It's just um, just has a new name. But the the issues around breast implants and breast implant surgery has been around actually since the 90s. Uh, just before our, our call, I actually looked up this chronological history, and it even goes back even further than that. But um, when did breast implants start? Like, do you, when was the first breast implant surgery, or roughly? In um, in the 60s, there was some of the uh, some of the first breast implant surgery. Like the very first application of any kind of breast augmentation started when a lipoma, so that's a um, basically a benign growth of fat, was transplanted into the breast as an attempt to create augmentation. People have been modifying and doing surgery on their bodies for a long time. Um, plastic surgery as a specialty has been around um, since since before the 1600s. Um, not in the wow. aesthetic surgery space, but more wow. as as a means. And actually, to go even further back, just just to give you some context, so plastic surgery doesn't refer necessarily to the use of plastic materials as as um, as, as it might seem. Uh, plastic and plastic surgery refers to plasticos to shape or mold. So this, mm. um, the 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 medical specialty of of shaping and molding the body has been around for a long time, and it really became um, its own specialty in its own right um, during the world War, World War II when when people were surviving with these horrific injuries that needed reconstruction. So so the real mm. fundamental basics of plastic surgery is, is in reconstruction, and then aesthetic surgery. Um, so um, I would say reconstruction is taking what some might consider to be the um, um, t- trying to fit in or make things functional and you know quote unquote normal. Nor- I know it's after not, like not the, injury or accident, after injury, or, right? Or born deformity or something like exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. Right. And then aesthetic surgery is more the space of taking um, and, and modifying to make something sort of super normal or, or more. There's no underlying problem with function or disease or anything like that. 
Right. But um, breast implants so breast have been implants, around for yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back back to your original question. They they've been around for a long time, um, since the '60s, and there's there's been um, a real evolution in the technology around them. But I think the underlying principles and basics have been really the same. It's just a bag of silicone. Like it, it hasn't really, I wouldn't say, if you look at all the technological advances in medicine, I don't think um, breast implant technology has really evolved to be so groundbreaking and new. There's just been changes in the way the implants are made, what they're made out of and what they're filled with. Mm. Yeah. And so with the breast implant illness, um, is that mainly related to the, the, um, like what they're made out of and how does that manifest for people? Yeah. So when, when we talk about um, breast, I would say women's health as it relates to breast implants, there's there's sort of two main categories of problems. There's breast implant illness and there's mm-hmm. breast cancer, uh, breast implant associated cancers. Oh my so gosh. yeah. And both of those are very real things. Um, the medical community may argue about the details of either, but they're very much, and, and in my experience working with patients, very much real things. So let's talk about the first one, breast implant illness. And bo- both in both categories, cancer and illness, both are related to the effect that the implant has on the body and the materials that it's made from. Right. Um, so, yeah. So in breast implant illness, um, the the symptoms that patients present with are they're very there's a they're broad and there's a lot of them and they um it's more of a syndrome in that um there's not like one specific type of symptom or something that can be diagnosed it's usually constellation like a number of different symptoms so it's anything from fatigue to hair loss to joint pain to itchy dry eyes dry mouth um depression weight loss um I'm not sure if I said joint pain, but like a really, really big, broad range. And mm-hmm. if you look at those at that category of symptoms, it really fits um, in the in the world of an autoimmune disease. So yes, autoimmune is when the, that's the body is thinking. attacking itself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and um, the the autoimmune uh, the autoimmune background for breast implant illness has been studied, and and the the reason why we think it occurs is also a known thing the implant itself creates a foreign body reaction. So anytime you put something in your body, whether it's a splinter that you accidentally got from the dock near the beach or a breast implant, the body has the same reaction to it. It's going to create this shell around it, this immune response that's going to try and encapsulate and protect it from the body. Breast implants do the same thing. So a capsule forms around the implant and it's like an inflammatory highway. It's full of all this inflammatory stuff that the body is creating to protect from the implant. Now, mm. as it turns out, implants themselves are actually full of stuff. They're full of silicone. And then if you look at the ingredients, there's hundreds and hundreds of different ingredients, some potentially more harmful than others. Ultimately, the dose is what makes the poison, the amount of the ingredient. But regardless, it's not just silicone that's in there. And um, it's become clear that silicone acts as something known as an adjuvant. An adjuvant in medicine is something that will trigger an immune response. So vaccines have adjuvants in them and other other things act as an adjuvant. It basically helps um, exaggerate a response. The reason that's a problem for patients is because if you have an implant and you are predisposed to any kind of autoimmune condition, having an implant and the silicone in the implant can put you over the edge and throw you right into this autoimmune condition, which we now know as breast implant illness. Mm. Yeah. And it's tricky because for a long time, the medical community, and even still is, is not fully accepting that this is a diagnosis and an issue for women. I personally started seeing this about five years ago in my practice, and I decided to stop using implants altogether because it was clear that it's not, um, it's not an obvious thing as to who might develop breast implant illness. And I decided until that's clear, why don't we just step away from this altogether? Wow. I wish that every medical professional had that level of ethics. Um, And I think many do, but it's hard when money's involved. And Mm. and yeah, I think it's really powerful that you made that choice. I mean, speaking of that choice and ethics, um, can you speak a little bit to the connection between the soul and physician and body? Yeah, that's, I like that question. That's, um, I think at the very beginning of why anybody 
at some point in their medical career either choose to go into medicine or continues or, or feels inspired is um, there's this really special space that gets created when you have a connection with a patient. Um, it's in a moment of extreme vulnerability and trust and empathy and skill. Um, and to be able to bring all those things together in one spot feels to me, at least in the work I do, um, as the highest calling of my soul, like why I was put here on this earth. Um, mm. If I was an artist, it would be when I had um, you know, a paintbrush in my hand. But in, in the context of surgery and the work that I do, it's, it's through the tools I have and the communications I have with patients. And I believe that every person, whether or not you're a physician, you, your soul has a calling and it's our job in this life to figure out um, what, what that is and how to bring together the right resources to make it happen. Um, mm. Medicine, fortunately, has some, some preconceived or pre-written rules about this stuff. Primum no nocere in Latin, which means first do no harm. And there's the Hippocratic Oath, which is, again, do no harm to your patients. Um, and as a profession, I think that's great because it, it just sort of sets the baseline to always be thinking um, as ethically as possible. Of course, there's a lot of gray areas. And this is something I love talking about with you, which is nothing is really black or white. And sometimes we have to find a way to live in the gray. And it's something I continuously navigate, even as a plastic surgeon, because it is a controversial field. The aesthetic industry is controversial. Um, but despite that, I, I still find a way to find my soul's calling in a, in a place where, where there is a lot of gray. Mm, because it, it, there is an interesting, um, what could seem like a paradox, but I see you actually marrying those things together really beautifully and cohesively, which is you're a deeply spiritual man. Um, you're a conscious man, you have a deeply spiritual practice and yeah, you work in the aesthetic industry, like plastic surgery. And it's like, okay. And so I'm curious, like, can you speak a little bit to how this has become your soul's calling? And I mean, beauty as a concept, like what, what does beauty mean to you? And yeah, I'd love to just hear you muse on that. I'm reminded of a book called Towards a Meaningful Life, where this this connection between the soul and the body is described so so eloquently and it and it really reflects a lot of why um, i believe so passionately in what i do and how i i see um my my mission in life uh, and uh so the vision of how the soul interacts with the body is is in the metaphor of a flame the flame is a is a unit there's the blue part which is the base of the flame and the and the orange red glowing part which lifts up towards the heavens so the orange glowing part is is more like the soul always trying to escape always trying to go up to back to its source the creator or whatever we call it in this universe and the blue the base of the flame is more the the body it's the grounded grounded part and the two really can't exist without the other and it's mm -hmm. the interplay of the two that creates the beauty of the flame and and just the light and I see that as such a good metaphor for the work that I do in that um, every one of us has a soul. We all have this, this drive, this mission, this purpose, this, this uh, force within us, which makes us want to be alive. And yet we are confined to the very real material uh, reality that we live in a body. We need to eat every morning. We need to drink. We need to breathe. We need to nourish this body. And our body is our vehicle to achieve what our soul's calling is. And it's um, it's our responsibility to a certain extent to take the best care of our body as possible. Where I see aesthetic surgery plays into this or plastic surgery plays into this is that it is possible to view your body, your vessel as a medium through which your soul expresses itself. And if you feel more aligned and more inclined and more called to do what it is that you're doing in this life, whether it's interacting with people, where it's growing a business or helping people, if it makes you feel more invigorated, more alive, more you to be in that body, then it's okay. Aesthetic mm -hmm. surgery is fine. It's it's aligned mm -hmm. with your intention of, of showing up as the best version of yourself. And yeah. that doesn't come with any judgment that people shouldn't do surgery um, for X, Y, and Z reasons, but that's sort of how I see. That's like my 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 guiding light, which is hopefully every patient that I'm helping, I'm helping them get a little bit closer to the vision of themselves that they want to see transformed so they can carry through the highest expression of their soul. 
Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Like I know if I had have been listening to that, it might have been harder for me to embrace prior to this retreat that I was just on because I had this really real experience. We just finished breast massage and we were sitting in an integration circle together and had had this really wild, expansive embodied ritual. And I'd say like most of the women, let's say half of the women were topless and we were going around and sharing and each of the women sharing their story with their breasts was so fascinating. We had one woman who had just experienced a rupture in one of her breast implants. And so she was sharing really vulnerably about um, you know, the judgment that she was placing on herself and how difficult that had been and that she's just about to get them removed and what a process that's been of like letting go for her. And then the, another woman had implants in and she'd said, you know, during during the ritual, she'd felt shame and like, I just want to, I, sh- I shouldn't have these because they'd been causing her a lot of physical pain for a long time. Um, and also I think we get into the spiritual work and we're like, oh, this all of a sudden isn't spiritual. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily true, right? It's like you're saying, it's about alignment. No one else can really determine what is right for you. And I think, um, yeah, it was like beautiful to hear her, her say that during the ritual, she was like, well, I'm not going to get surgery during the ritual. So I may as well just enjoy the body that I'm in right now and enjoy the implants as they are, knowing that I can you know, make a change later. And then another woman shared that she felt really comfortable and she felt so alive in her body, but she had had a breast reduction. And she said, you know, if I hadn't had that reduction, like I don't actually know if I could have shown up how I was showing up. And she said, and I don't know if that means that this is fake the way that I'm showing up now. And, you know, helping her kind of process through that, that this is her real lived experience and it's okay for her to feel empowered now. It would have been okay for her to feel empowered then. It would be okay for her to feel disempowered in either of those scenarios. And just, you know, another woman talking about she'd been breastfeeding and she'd breastfed three children. And so like her coming to terms with with her breasts as they are now. So it's just like, all these women with all these different stories and, you know, some of them including plastic surgery and some of them including aesthetic surgery and some of them not, and none of them were less valuable or valid. It didn't make any of them less spiritual or worthy of love or in their human experience. It was just so unique to each of them. And that was actually really transformative for me because I definitely had in my mind had this idea that, well, if I could support women to just love themselves enough, then they would never make that choice. And that's actually not true. What I realized through that, that's just this judgment that we hold or this like spiritual righteousness that we believe we know what is right. And I actually was able to really loosen the grip on that in the face of real women and real stories and say, actually, who the fuck am I to know what is right for anyone and what self-love looks like? to anyone. So I just really invite anyone listening in case they were having those thoughts as well of like, well, you know, it's not spiritual to do these things. It's like, I've been there and I've totally had those judgments. Um, And for me, what I've realized is that I don't actually get to decide um, what is spiritual for anyone else. And as you're saying, it's like, if it makes someone feel more alive, more aligned and more able and supported to go into the world and share their gifts, then, you know, who are we to say? That being said, I think so much of this pressure that women feel is kind of like from societal beauty standards. So I'm curious to hear you talk about like, how do you think society has shaped beauty? What is beauty? Tell me. <laughs> this is also something I think is, is, is super important to talk about. I'm really glad you asked about it. There's a great book called The Beauty Myth by Naomi Wolf, which breaks down it it's one of the best sort of modern day representations of what has how has society crafted what we call the professional beauty quotient pbq Mm -hmm. as a as a way to um really unfairly hold women to a different standard than men and just create all this extra um i would just say time wasted like life units wasted on Mm on on doing things looking up and showing up a certain way like when i when i was reading this book and i thought about it and i broke down the numbers i was like how long does it take me to get ready for work what are the kinds of things that i do and then you scale that over years and it's like wow i have extra months if not years of my life available for me and it's so unfair uh that that it's it's just become this way um you know, obviously there is something we call dimorphism in nature that, you know, b- between male and female species, there's always differences, but this is like, this is a heavily reinforced through the challenging natures of, of, of human psychology. Um, another or sort of way I think about 
societal beauty standards is um, our, our mutual friend Liv. She 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 talks about this great topic, which is Moloch or the game theory of beauty, mm. and and thinking about beauty from a from a game theory perspective is really interesting. Which is, um, you know, like every little new procedure or or makeup or thing that you can do to, in theory, get an edge um, to look better, feel better. It's essentially a race to the bottom. There's no end. There's no end to, mm. you know, there's, there's no one that's going to be like, oh, that's it. I'm literally the most beautiful. I don't have to do anything else. It's, it's a, the, the whole way the industry is shaped is to create more scarcity, more um, feelings of doubt and insecurity. Um, and it's really ageist. It's really sexist. And ultimately yes. it's not promoting um, um, a feelings of security, um, confidence or health. And it's gotten mm. even worse with technology because uh, with time, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, you would compare yourself to maybe a magazine cover of, of like the most beautiful, whatever, whoever society thinks the most beautiful person is, and it's a touched up photo. But nowadays you're comparing yourself to literally an unattainable version of yourself through an AI filter. And, and Lib Oof. talks about this in her video. It's, it's great. Uh, well, it, it's great in that she highlights it. I, I think it's overall terrible this is happening. But there's yeah. no question that society systematically has created this this gamification of being the most beautiful to the point where there's no end. And, um, you know, unless we totally switch over to simulation and live in avatars that we can easily modify, like it's just going to get more and more crazy um in terms of the this the the standards that women have to try to uphold and, and men too to be fair it's it's it is in both but heavily uh more biased towards women yeah i think about that like with aging how for men it's kind of you know like george clooney like silver fox there's kind of um a sexiness to aging it's still celebrated there's still sex appeal in that and i'm like ready for us to create a new narrative around erotically charged sexually liberated empowered smart intelligent powerful women who are aging and also getting to like um maintain that their own sense of eroticism mm. instead of being stripped of it so it's like it's so interesting as you say the amount of life units wasted on that I'm curious, how do you, how do you walk that line? Like I'm hearing you talk about, you know, yeah, there's the extreme end where we're competing against an AI version of ourselves. Oof, oh my gosh, I would hate to be a teenager today. I don't even know. It was hard enough already. I can't even imagine. I have so much empathy for teenagers with Snapchat and filters and blah, blah, blah. But how do you, how do you walk that line between body positivity and body enhancement? I think it's about having real conversations. Um, I have very real conversations with my patients uh, about real expectations and real outcomes about what I think is realistic. And that's why the consultation is, is, is really so important because it's a chance to, you know, up until the point where uh, they step into my office, I have no idea the world that they've been exposed to, what information they've they've read or, or where they're coming from. I can assume, I can make assumptions because we all live in the in the world where we're inundated with this stuff. But some some people have tons of background, tons of research, um, really know exactly what they want, what they're looking for, and um, and other patients, you know, they're coming in just kind of more curious and don't have as much uh, information. And some people are doing it. What uh, some patients are really doing it just for themselves, and I can feel that in the consultation when I ask them and talk them through it. And and sometimes they're not doing it for themselves; they're doing it for the belief, uh, self a self limiting belief that you know they may have because of a partner or because of a certain job. So the consultation really is so important to have a real conversation to drop in and understand why somebody wants to 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 do a, um, to have a surgery to to undergo a procedure. And, mm. and in, in engaging in that way, I'm able to understand where somebody's coming from and I can better help understand what their expectations are for the outcome. Um, mm -hmm. And as it relates to body positivity, you know, there's just certain ways I approach and, and things that I notice, like having, ha having done um, so many consultations and procedures, I just see the overlying rhetoric that um, women I'd say in general people, but specifically women have towards their bodies. It's, it's sometimes it's, it's, uh, I have a lot of empathy because some, the first thing I'll say is, oh, I hate this part of me, or, or I don't, this, this, this part has to go, or this I don't like. And every time it just cuts me a little bit because I'm just like, oh man, it's mm. like, 
just the language and the and the perspective that starts in the discussion and there's no judgment around it it's just like wow like this is this let's reframe the discussion let's say let's honor that this is this is part of who we are and we get the opportunity to do something to in, enhance this part of ourselves so we can love it more as opposed to hate it um and it's those little shifts about having those real conversations and changing the way we see ourselves because i really think it starts so young and it starts in front of the mirror you know, the mirror is not a positive, happy place for the majority of people. It's our chance to check in before we leave the house to see what's wrong, what needs to be fixed so we can be presentable for the world. Um, when instead it could be a place of positive affirmations and intention setting, you know, it's, it's your, you're literally meeting yourself for the first time. Um, yes. so, so when we talk about walking that line between body positivity and body affirmations, I will often do the consultations in front of the mirror. And if I feel so inclined, if it feels the right setting, I'll often have a patient kind of set that intention and affirmation right there in front of the mirror. Um, because it's, it's, I see surgery and, um, it, it really is a ceremony, like having, having gone through, um, the medical world and also other types of training and things like that. It's surgery really is a, is a, is a ceremony. There is an altered state of consciousness. You're going through a powerful physical and psychological change. And on the other side lies a new you that you get to meet. And Whoa. yeah. And, and it's through that, that, that bridge between body positivity and, and modification that like there's, that's there is another gray area there and so uh to answer your question it is it is a challenging space but it's it's through real discussions and and and, and um real real those real conversations that help help navigate that space mm. wow the idea that surgery can be a ceremony that is very profound i've never even pondered that as a possibility but i guess the tantric perspective that everything is sacred that that everything every external energy every potential outcome all of it is sacred and all of this divine and life really challenges us to see if if we can really hold that belief and that level of nuance and complexity without getting in the like righteousness of this is right or this is wrong and really creating space for people to have their own experience of what is right and wrong and i think what i think about when i think of the idea of people having surgery is this idea of like my hope would be that a person could get to the space of recognizing like, okay, I don't need this in order to be okay. I could love myself. I can be okay. I can be a messy, imperfect, insecure at times human being, but I'm still worthy of love. I'm still worthy of belonging. And, and like, if a human could get to that place, then perhaps it comes from that different state inside of them where it's like, and wouldn't it be nice if, and like, it would be meaningful and exciting and like heart opening for them to have, you know, whatever they want. And I know this sounds like a real, it's like, I almost don't want to say it out loud, but cause there's another part of me that thinks, you know, it would be very easy for me to sit here and say, oh, no one should ever have surgery um, because I sit in a relative position of privilege. I was born with, a relative and I'm not a supermodel, but I'm just going to speak frankly here and people might not like it and think that I'm super conceited, but I was born with a relative amount of what society deems as conventionally attractive, you know, was able to survive my college years off modeling. So I think it would be really actually fucked up of me in a way to sit here and say from this position of relative privilege, like people should never have body enhancement or, or any kind of surgery to feel, to feel good. And then on the other hand, it's challenging because I'm like, wouldn't it be nice if we lived in a world that didn't put so much pressure on people that they would never have to feel that they need to change anything about themselves. But then we have to hold the reality that we don't fucking live in that world. And we're probably like, uh, we're always going to live in a world of contrast. So then how do we, how do we exist in that? As you're saying, like, we have to just make space for the gray and it's like, yeah, it's an interesting and always challenging. Like I'm being challenged in this conversation to expand my awareness, to hold more and have more compassion and more space for a variety of experiences. So I'm curious if people um, listening are feeling about that and would be want them to check in around it. Um, we were talking about breast implant illness and that you practice this kind of new way of working with breast augmentation i think it's fat grafting mm -hmm. i'd love for you to speak more to what is that sure, how yeah. is it different so fat grafting as a technology has been around for a long time uh, plastic surgeons have been 
discovered many over 50 years ago that you can take fat from one part of the body and transfer it somewhere else and it will survive. Um, a graft is any tissue that's taken from one place to another that establishes its own blood supply. So fat grafting as, a, as an idea has been around for a long time. Its use in the breast it, uh, as a means of, of primary augmentation and meaning to, do, to, to, to enhance the size of the breast is, is a bit more new. Um, still been around for a little while, but the real, I think, shift in, in technology and technique to make it as good, and if not in some situations, better than breast implants, is only really evolved in the past five years, and it's still continuing to evolve. Um, that's something that I've focused my practice almost exclusively on. So I do a type of procedure where I'm able to remove fat from the body while patients are awake and comfortable. I then process and, 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 and do some things to the fat to increase the rate which survives. And then I transplant that fat back in a way where I sculpt and literally plant, like planting little seeds. And um, some of the fat uh, does not survive, but the majority of it does. And the parts that survive act just like uh, regular fat anywhere else in the body. I think it's a more anatomic and natural way of doing a breast augmentation. Natural, of course, kind of in quotations, because it's still surgery. It's not just a natural thing completely, yes. but way better than yeah. putting in a foreign body or like an implant in. And the reason is because fat um, is is mostly what the breast is, is made from. The breast is made from breast tissue, which is a gland, and, the, and then fat. So by replacing it and increasing the size with fat, it's a more natural uh, looking and feeling results. And of course, you don't have to deal with all the issues and complications from implants. Um, no mm. procedure is, is, is perfect, and it's still a surgical procedure. But in my experience and the way that I've seen the technology evolve and, and the te technique that I use, it's um, my goal has been to make this a safe and reliable replacement for implants. So um, patients never consider getting an implant when they know that this exists. And you get the added benefit yes. of, if, of sculpting and potentially shaping another part of the body if that's if that's what you want because we have to take fat from somewhere. Mm. Wow, it seems like a um, much safer, yeah, more. I mean, yeah, natural in quotations. But if someone is really set and they're gonna get implants anyway, to have an alternative where yeah, they may not, like you were saying, get the breast implant related cancer, they won't get the breast implant related illness. They're just having fat from their own body moved and also that they're awake because that's mm -hmm. like that exponentially reduces the risk right because i huge, feel like doesn't going move. under yeah yeah most of the complications that happen in surgery are because your body is in this extremely vulnerable state known as general anesthesia like you're unconscious you don't have any muscle tone um, so a lot more complications can happen then doing it awake is just such uh, you don't have to recover from general anesthesia but it also means like your systems are still online so the the risk associated with surgery are much less and because recovery from breast implant surgery is like a big deal from what I understand. Is the recovery different from fat it, grafting it's, in the breasts? Um, it's way, way less. It's still a recovery process. Um, again, it's still yeah. surgery, but you know, you're not have, you don't have a big incision. Everything is done through a small, tiny little entry point. That's only a few millimeters in diameter. Um, there's no, usually when breast implants are placed, the muscle, the pectoralis muscle, so the muscle that controls the chest movement is, is, is moved and cut. So there's, you know, even though, um, the recovery, it, many surgeons design the breast implant recovery to be a lot, to, to be relatively straightforward. It's, it's still, it's still surgery right? and, and way, way more invasive than, um, doing things through a tiny little entry point. So fat grafting is minimally invasive, whereas opposed to breast implant surgery is, you know, requires, requires real cutting of, of tissue. Mm. And yeah. do you have a lot of women coming in and getting, is it called explant? Or explant, they remove yeah. The imp yeah. Is that a lot yeah. of what you do? Uh, it's, uh, explant surgery is a lot of what I do. And then uh, doing the, imp um, the fat grafting to the breast instead of my, my take is that, you know, as and the reason I'm trying so heavily to focus on fat grafting is because as long as there's still surgeons putting them in doing implant surgery, there's going to be surgeons removing them. And it just be, creates this sort of like conflict of interest revolving door where what we really need is a technology and a new procedure that's more safe and reliable. So people stop getting implants in, in the first place. Um, and I wanted yeah. to say one, one thing you reminded me of when you talked to, when you were talking about sur surgery as a ceremony is I, um, a friend of mine who had her explant um, she, she's, she's very much spiritually aligned and has uh, committed to her practice. And before her surgery, she did this intention setting where she basically put 
all this focus and guided all of the negative and dark energy and thoughts that she's had about her body and and what the implants have done to her over these years. She basically kind of like focused and harnessed it into the implants, almost like a symbolic kind of like, she like really packed them in there. And so when mm-hmm. she had her surgery, it was kind of like, she described it a little bit like an exorcism, like it was just removed, that yeah. energy was just gone. So um, wow. So just to speak to explant surgery, you know, when I see patients go through it, some patients immediately feel relief. And, you Oof. know, some of that might be explained through biology, um, just because the, the foreign body is removed and the inflammation goes down. But I also think there's a big psychological component where this thing that you just don't want to be part of you, that's part of you is finally gone. It's just literally yes. a weight off your chest. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And a, yeah, it's a foreign thing. I can't, I, you know, I, no judgment, honestly, I think women, we should stop telling women what the fuck to do with their bodies and women do it to other women more than anyone. So zero judgment. If you have implants, and you're listening to this and you're rocking them and loving them, but I can also totally understand why women feel that like sense of there's like this foreign thing that they they need to kind of remove but um i imagine it's a really hard choice because until they have an alternative they might feel like the breast is going to be or the structure of the breast is going to be um stretched out or act probably even different than it was prior to surgery right like if you get an ex um an explant i imagine the structure of the breast is quite uh, absolutely changed. um it depends on the size it depends on a lot of things the size of the implant how much the tissue is stretched but the shape and, and appearance of the breast will absolutely change afterwards and sometimes other surgery is needed to to basically optimize or, or get the breasts uh looking to a way that the, the patient wants but i'm really glad what you yeah. said before about the no judgment because it's something i face a lot too and Absolutely. There is no judgment for anybody who chose to get implants, who's still considering getting implants, who's gotten them. Um, the, and, and the truth is the majority of people with implants will never have an issue. Um, I, I was just looking up, I think it's on average, maybe about 30% of patients will have some sort of, of issue, which means there's 70% of people out there who have breast implants who have no issue with them and may never have an issue. Yeah. And um, and for everything that I'm saying about implants that I don't like, the truth is it's actually still the gold standard Um, approach for patients who've had breast cancer and want to have a reconstruction because yeah um, and that's and that's also an important discussion to have and there's and there's no judgment that happens there because it's absolutely a a woman's right to if to want to restore her femininity after breast cancer and if a breast implant is the best way to do that and um, unfortunately fat grafting isn't usually the best option because the the volume needed is is quite large so it's usually only something an implant can do um, but I even, even that I think might be changing in the future, but, but all that to say is I'm so glad that you said that because this isn't like a breast implant bashing, um, no. judging any of that. Uh, it's just, it's just, I think having a very real conversation about both sides of the, the story. Yeah. And just exploring, I think like, at least for me, I'm exploring like my own judgment, my own bias that come up and really using this as an opportunity to question that. So that there can just be more space for women to do whatever the fuck they want to do with their bodies. <laughs> I'm like, Amen. it's your body, honey. Yeah. Do whatever the hell you want to do. And yeah. also discussing that there's a safe um, alternative if people are wanting to get explants, but you know, perhaps feel like they can't because they're not sure, you know, they want to have some shape or whatever it is that there's so many different reasons that we can't even ever cover here of why a woman might want body enhancement that frankly are none of our business. Um, so I just think it's wonderful that there are like alternatives and this other option. I have a kind of random question about the fat grafting. Maybe it's not that random. I'm sure other people listening are thinking if it's just fat from your body, if you lose weight, do, do the the breast augmentation, does it disappear? That's a great question. And Yes. Uh, I wouldn't say it disappears because the fat cells actually themselves still remain. It's like anybody who's gone or experienced weight fluctuation. Um, we're, we're more or less born with all the fat cells we'll ever have in our life. We, we gain a few up throughout puberty, but it's the fat. Oh, wow. it's, it's, yeah. It's the size of the fat cells that changes throughout our life. It's not really the absolute number. Like I would say up until about puberty, you're kind of gaining cells, but um, so that's, that's not a correct myself if you're not born with all the fat cells, but like up until about puberty, um, you're, you're gaining cells. But after that point, it's the size of the fat cells themselves that change. And what that means in terms of fat grafting is if you gain a lot of weight or lose weight, the size of the fat cells will go in the same direction. So if you gain weight and you had fat grafting in the breast, the breast size will increase just like it would if you were normally gaining weight. And if you lose weight, it'll also go down. And I've had patients kind of use that to their advantage. They will sort of have natural weight fluctuations and see a, see a change in the result. But, but, but oh, yeah. So- 
it's possible in theory if you were to lose a lot of weight for for the size to go down. But if you regain it, it would still be there because the fat cells that survived are still there. Okay, wow. So this is interesting. So like people who have larger breasts or women, women people, anyone can have breasts, yeah. who have larger breasts, do they just have more natural, more fat cells there naturally? It's probably a combination of two things. So they would have more breast gland, which also cycles mm -hmm. will, will fluctuate with the cycle, will grow in size and decrease in size, and they have more fat cells. Huh. Yeah. And wait, that's, wait. And that's okay, genetically so that's predetermined. Why genetically predetermined and wait so that's why women know like before your period your boobs get really like mm -hmm. way bigger is that that's the gland i don't that's even know gland. that yeah <laughs> yeah so that so the the hormones progesterone and estrogen are always fluctuating and when progesterone increases just before your cycle the it ca it stimulates the breast glands to grow and it's also the same hormone in pregnancy that causes the breast glands to grow oh so when your breasts get really big for nursing or pregnancy, it's the gland swelling, not any increase in the fat necessarily. There's also an increase in fat, but it's mostly the gland. Okay. Yeah. Like so many, I mean, wow. pregnancy is its own. We could probably do many podcasts on that topic. I think it's incredible <laughs> what the body goes through. Um, but the yes. hormonal changes in pregnancy do cause uh, not just an increase in the gland, but also in the fat, but mostly the gland. Um, can you speak to some of the changing trends for better or worse around beauty aesthetics? Sure. Um, everything less invasive is certainly mm. as, as far as um, I think there's two ways to think about it. There's what what is aesthetically attractive or beautiful as a trend, but then there's how is that trend implemented? Um, mm. So if you look throughout history, that's kind of, it's kind of a fascinating topic because you can look at Renaissance paintings and see these these large voluptuous bodies that were considered to be sort of the pinnacle of beauty, and then over time it transitions to to you know completely the opposite, and then at some point it was really small breasts, and the Baywatch era was really big breasts, and then the never ending cascade of things that are popular in facial aesthetics. So beauty trends are always changing. I would say right now uh, the the things that are most popular as far as like facial aesthetics goes have been pretty consistently popular. Uh, it's just the way that they're done is, has changed. So a lot of facial aesthetics follow something called the golden ratio, uh, which we see all mm. the time in nature, which is this ratio of how, you know, the, the shape and size of the face, uh, the number is 1.618 for anyone who's interested. It's kind of geeky and nerdy. But um, so phi, the golden ratio, is a representation of certain facial proportions and aesthetics. And most surgeons are usually trying to, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, usually trying to achieve those aesthetics. And the things that you may have noticed is usually the high cheekbones, the ratio of the forehead to the nose to the, to the lower part of the face. Um, but regardless, whatever the trend is, what I've learned is that there's actually no real definition of beauty. And something I talk about with all my patients is whatever aesthetic I think is appropriate actually doesn't matter. It's, it's the look that you most strongly identify with and, and find confidence with. Um, the, the, as far as the trends go in terms of how things are being done, like I said, uh, it's, it's about be, as being minimally invasive as possible and preventative rather than uh, restorative. So trying to do things mm. earlier that... Um, I, I, I think are less invasive. So good skincare regime, um, you know, really basic lifestyle stuff. Don't drink, don't smoke, get enough sleep, eat healthy. Like that really sets a good baseline. Um, and there's really kind of by the decade, the way that things uh, have evolved in terms of thinking about stuff. So like in your twenties and thirties, making sure you have a really good skincare regime um, in the thirties and forties, uh, patients tend to do some more minimally invasive stuff. And it's in the later decades of life uh, that there's more surgical options that are, are more popular. But even still in surgery, everything is trending towards minimally invasive. So not having to go to sleep for your procedure, less cutting and more uh, tools and, and devices that can that can make the change. Hmm. Well, what a fascinating world we live in and Lord only knows where it will go next. But what I am certain and grateful for is that humans like you are working in this space who are super conscious and loving and kind, ethical and intentional. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious if people are interested in, I'm sure there are plenty of women listening who live in the States or could travel. I know you, your practice is in California, mm -hmm. right? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. If they were interested in meeting or working with you, how would they find you? Yeah. Best place to look me up is on my Instagram. It's at drjohn.k. That's D-R-J-O-N.k. And uh, my practice is located in Beverly Hills. And yeah, more than happy to always answer questions and connect. Mm, yeah, I loved what you said. It can be a ceremony. And yeah, for all of us listening, like, may this be an invitation for less judgment to each other as women, just like letting women do whatever it is that they want to do with their own bodies and go on their own journeys. And none of us can pretend to know what is right for someone else. Before we go, there's actually one other question I have. <laughs> What's your perspective on Botox? Because this can be really controversial. I feel like, um, you know, it's it's a I think I'm right in saying a neurotoxin. That sounds mm -hmm. pretty scary and gnarly. Um, although I know you also said earlier it's not the substance, it's the dose that makes mm -hmm. the poison. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, like what are you what's your perspective on on Botox? Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. It is a toxin. It's actually one of the most potent toxins ever, I think, based on the quantity. Whoa. Um but it's what really matters is is the dose. The dose makes the poison. So, uh, Botox has been around for a long time. It was discovered as a uh, aesthetic tool when an ophthalmologist was trying to treat an eye issue because it causes mild paralysis of muscles. And uh, this, the ophthalmologist noticed when he was treating somebody's eye muscles that the wrinkles disappeared. And lo and behold, Bo Botox was born. It's been it's <laughs> been probably one of the most uh, popular aesthetic things out there for a long time. As far as we know, it's safe. Um, I'm always keeping my finger on the pulse to see is like, is there any kind of weird stuff happening? Just recently, I saw some some news. I, I, don't, I don't know that there's enough evidence behind it to say that it's really a thing. But um, in, in my practice, when I use Botox, um, there's certain indications for people that shouldn't have it if they have certain medical conditions. But by and large, I do think mm -hmm. it's safe. Um, it's it's derived from a, a bacterium, a bacteria that does produce the toxin. And so it's like tiny, tiny, tiny amounts, like nano picograms that are injected. Um, over, over time, um, the body does habituate to it and there's always evolving new kind of um, neurotoxins out there that are coming out. Botox is just the brand name of one. There's many different kinds out there. Right. And um, you said you read something recently can you extrapolate yeah, a bit? Um, I, kind of, I, I, have to, uh, I can't remember the exact thing it was in reference to, but some patients were, were commenting that they felt like it had affected their thyroid. And that was actually the first mm. time, first time I'd seen that. Um, but I don't, I don't want to uh, misquote or m give misinformation because I don't feel well informed enough on it. But I just read that just yesterday and I was like, that's the first time I've seen anything like that. Um, right. And, and, you know, if you look, if you look out there and this, I think this is, goes by and large towards any information, but specifically within medicine, there's usually going to be information out there that will support whatever theory or, or thought you have uh, about anything, <laughs> yep. about anything. So it's the, good, it's bad. Yeah, it's in exactly. So, for so, that. so the best thing you can do is, is, is really approach things from, from a critical thinking perspective and evaluate the evidence. And that's super important for in medicine for all doctors to, to do because if, if you strongly believe in something, you'll find the evidence to support it. And even in the breast implant mm -hmm. community, but I've, I, I, I just, I think it's good to say stuff. Like when you, when you make a statement, I, I always try to think and back it up. Like how, how committed, how much money would I put on this so that this is the thing or how, how, how much sincerity of like out of a hundred percent, the breast implant, uh, causing a problem. I'm like a 99, like it's very strongly causing problems and been studied heavily. Um, the link between Botox yes. and these thyroid issues, I don't really know enough about it. I'd put it at like a 5%. Uh, like I just read a few little yeah. blips here and there. Um, <laughs> I do think um, it's always good to reevaluate the evidence. And the, the truth is, you know, it, it takes time for things to become an issue and for there to be enough noise for things to get properly investigated. So that doesn't mean that all yeah. all stuff out there is either true or, or false. It just it just takes time. Like, it, look, you know, it's taken over 30 years for this awareness about breast implants to become a thing. That's yeah, that's true. It takes time. How long has Botox been done for? Um, I think since the late seventies, early eighties. So it's it's yeah, also been quite a while, about 40, 40, 40 years or so. Um, but given given how much, like how many, you know, it's millions of people getting getting uh, getting Botox a year, and the fact that it's been relatively safe, like the, the known complications are, are pretty clear, which is certain people with medical condition, neurological conditions, shouldn't be getting it, and mm -hmm. um, and that you know, 
if it's not injected properly, it can cause problems like your eyelid to droop or paralysis. What's interesting actually about Botox is that the majority of its applications are not in aesthetics. They're used by other medical specialties for other medical uses, like everything from gut problems to stuff in the mouth to like all over the body for a bunch of different uses. Um, but but I'm um, I don't definitely appreciate the question where it's coming from because it's you know it should should raise some questions and concerns if if like one of the most powerful toxins out there is being used in medicine so people should just ask questions you know what's the safety around it how how does it work and and how do we make sure it stays safe mm, yeah and I love that you are still in the questioning and looking at research even if it challenges your current view it's so important that we do that and i mm. think it's um it's really appreciated in someone that does what you do and you mm. as a human so we're going to move into rapid fire questions oh Mama. cool right. are you ready yeah hit me <laughs> i'm gonna edit them slightly for you because <laughs> I don't know. It feels it just feels wrong. You're a doctor to ask you some of them <laughs> that are a little more risque. So Should I be, I'm not gonna Am I gonna turn red? <laughs> no, I'm gonna edit it for you. Okay, cool. I think I can handle it. Go for it. <laughs> um, what's the most important thing for successful relationships in your opinion? Listening. Hmm. Yes. If you could be any animal, what animal would you be? My dog. A husky. I'd be a husky. <laughs> I'm trying to answer oh, as quickly as possible. You said rapid fire, so I have a beautiful husky. <laughs> well, he's my greatest teacher. I watch him, and I think he's just the wisest, most peaceful animal on this planet. So yeah, my dog. He's a he's a special soul, yeah. and um, it's really turned into more like tantric, process oriented questioning, which is a joke that's been going for many many episodes now. So don't rush. No one does. Oh, okay. <laughs> tantric I process. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So it's a mouthful. Rapid fire is easier. But um if you could have if you could set your last meal on earth, what would it be? <laughs> the first thing I thought of was like, man, I, I want Patrick Drake to cook me a meal. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Whatever he cooks sense. for me, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't I would just let him curate the most delicious meal for me. I know he's got so much love and yes. attention to food. Um probably something delicious, most likely something vegan. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go out um, in a Dr. non non harm way. Yeah. Yes, I him so love that about you. And last one, if you could leave a message if there was a universal answering machine that everyone in on earth and beyond would hear today what would you say love is the answer mm. yes oh, yes that's what i'd say love oh. is the answer mm. thank you so much for being here brother i deeply appreciate your wisdom and getting to see a different side of you your dear brother and friend and just a reminder for anyone who wants to connect with dr john at dr john dot k yeah Did that's that right? d-r-j-o-n dot k yeah amazing and i want to thank you, thank you. i appreciate you for holding the space this these amazing conversations you have on all topics but most importantly just being the light in the gray thank you so much angel i appreciate you mm, love you brother that's it for today, Awakened One, and just a quick thank you from me. Thank you for gifting us with your most precious resource, your time and attention, so that we can make this world a more awakened place. And if we're not friends on Instagram yet, then we absolutely should be. So come on over and say hello at Angelica Alana, and I'll see you there and see you next week.